market in 2004, Matir held numerous positions in General Motors sales and marketing organization in the U.S. and overseas. Matir earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Western Michigan University and a master's degree in marketing and advertising from the University of Detroit. Today he will give an overview of IH Market's commercial vehicle analysis based on both new vehicle registrations and vehicles in operation. Throughout the presentation, he will be fielding questions, so be sure to submit your questions using the chat feature in your control panel. Again, thank you, and join me in welcoming Gary Lapierre. Thank you, Gina. Uh, again, as Gina mentioned, we're going to take you through a very quick overview of the commercial vehicle in the United States and Canada, and we're going to take you kind of what we call inside the numbers. So if you look at the, uh, the agenda, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a little bit of introduction to make sure everybody is aware of, you know, really who is IHS and what do we have as far as information that can help our clients and others make good business decisions in the commercial space. So we'll do that for the U.S. where most of the time will be spent. And then we'll talk a little bit about Canada. We'll look at the global outlook for commercial vehicles. And then we'll end up with, and we may not discuss it in total unless you know, unless we have time, but if we don't have time, what I've included in the information for those who uh, obtain a copy is the current new federal regulations that came out in September that impact the commercial vehicles, both uh, vehicles in class four through eight, as well as trailers. So there's there's a um, legislation out there that's been put on the, on the table as far as the kinds of uh, fuel economy and emissions that these vehicles will have to meet out into the next decade. So without uh, further conversation, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of talk about who is IHS Market. Many of you may have known us as RL Polk. And uh, what we have is a company now that can drive information, expertise, and analytics across the globe. And we bring together the historical perspective that Polk has always been known for and that would be history plus what's going on in the marketplace today. And then add in the future look that IHS has been very strong in for a number of years. So you now have the best of, of both worlds with the IHS market automotive products. Now when you look at uh, our coverage, we basically track 1.2 billion vehicles in operation across the globe. We track over 70 unique brands and we have about 700 suppliers that we're doing business with on an ongoing basis. Now, what does that mean for you is that there's more than 50,000 key customers. So we've basically talking about the little customers as well as the big customers. We have more than 75% of our customers are in the global Fortune 500, and we do business in 150 different countries around the world. And when we talk about doing business around the world, we actually have feet on the ground who are living in those markets, understanding what's going on in the dynamics of the market so that they can then back convey that back to us and help us put together our global view of what's going on, whether it be automotive, whether or not it be energy, it could be chemicals, it could be, you know, parts uh, supplies. All of that feeds into services that we have for our clients. Now, when we look around the globe, quite frankly, uh, many of the, the features or many of the things that are impacting the U.S. commercial vehicle market, like driver shortages, the autonomous truck, all the way through connectivity and fleet business strategies, those are many of the same things that we look at and see around the world. So they're not unique to the United States, Canada, or Puerto Rico. They are uh, issues that are confronting the commercial space around the world. We then take that information and we look at the economic environment, we look at consumer demand for goods, the size of the industry, and then with all of that information, we help our clients make smart business growth. And you say, well, how do you do that? Well, our model is that we collect purchase from every state, now I'm just going to talk about the United States and Canada now, but we we purchase every month vehicle registrations, whether or not that's the first time a vehicle has found its way into commerce to the first time owner, or it's the fifth owner of that vehicle. We track that information. We track it by VIN, 
and therefore we have all of the information available in the VIN available for our client. Now we break it into two types of, of categories. One would be on the left hand side of this chart and that's what we call statistics and lead generation. We can talk about the number of fleets in the United States that have cars and trucks registered to them. We can tell you how big that, those fleets are, how many they are, what the composition of those fleets look like. But most importantly, we can identify the owner by name. We can provide names and addresses and other contact information for those fleets. Because the big difference between the commercial space and the individual or the retail space for any product, be it car, truck, motorcycle, that information, uh, anything that's registered to an individual is not allowed in the stream of commerce. But if you look at business registrations, the B2B type registration, so a, a vehicle registered to a business, that information is available for us to use and provide to our clients for marketing purposes. So that's the left-hand side of the, the chart you're looking at. On the right-hand side, we have something called statistical and lead generation specifically for trucks. So we track the same data, but just for the truck market, starting at class one, all, working all the way up through class eight. And the types of information that we have can be used in various facets of a company's planning and strategy development. So we can look at new truck registrations, they're updated monthly, and we can go all the way back to 1985 by month. And you say, well, what purpose does that serve? Well, Many of our clients, when they're trying to understand the market environment, a new um, manufacturer bringing a product in, economic downturn or increases, they want to see what has happened in the marketplace when certain things occur in the marketplace. And they can best do that by tracking what has happened over time on a month-by-month -month basis. In addition, we have vehicles in operation. So those are all vehicles on the road. We currently track about 64 million trucks on the road in the United States and where they're located and who owns them. That information is updated quarterly and available for both the U.S. and Canada as well as Puerto Rico. Then we also track trailers for those uh, companies that are involved in the trailer market. We, we track new registrations of trailers, again, back to 1985. We do not track vehicles in operation for trailers, and that's primarily because our business model is looking for repeatable flow of information. And when you look at trailers, there's no consistent reporting of trailers across the United States. There are some states that report trailer registrations for life. There are some states that re require an annual registration of that trailer, and there are other states that have two or three year uh, repeatable registration. So without the, re, the uh, consistent flow of information, we have elected to just track new registrations of trailers. But when we do that, we can track it by uh, over 50 different uh, trailer manufacturers, trailer types, and again, we know the owner of those trailers based on the B2B uh, formula that says that we can track owners and identify. So we can actually track uh, trailers by owner and see whether or not there's a correlation between the trailers they're purchasing versus the new vehicles they're purchasing, obviously primarily uh, tracking tr uh, tractors. We also do some work on replacement demand for commercial vehicles. Uh, we track about 11 categories and we track about 81 different parts uh, and provide a forecast of those parts, again, for the next 12 months and we can identify it right down to fleets by name and by uh, vehicle composition. And lastly, we take that information and we track about 2.3 million uh, fleets in our data set that can be matched to business data from Dun & Bradstreet. So if you're interested in knowing how many fleets of a certain composition, how long that fleet has been in business, what their revenue is, who their officers are, what their credit rating is, all of those things can be garnered from our data based on our relationship with Dun & Bradstreet as the premier uh, collector of business information uh, around the globe. So that's a little bit about our data. So without talking any more about us, what I want to now start on 
is how we look at the data. And the very first thing that we look at is what percent of a certain vehicle category, and in this case we're looking at GVWs, are in fact registered to a business. So if you look at the, the bars, they represent percent of the registrations of that GVW that are in fact accounted for by businesses. So the, the dark green bar on the far left side of each of these bars over a year, that's class one trucks. So one C trucks, there's a little bit over 20% on a pretty regular basis. So 20% of all class one C trucks are in fact registered to a uh, business. Now you say, well, it's a small percent. That's a small percent, yes, but it's taken against a very large number of vehicles. So when you're looking about, you know, trying to understand or prospect or sell services or provide services to these fleets, there's a rather substantial quantity of uh, fleets that operate Class 1 trucks. And then you can see as you work to the lime green bar, that's Class 2. That steps up over 30% of the uh, vehicles are, in fact, registered to a vehicle. You get the green, or excuse me, the orange bar, which is what I call the transition bar. These are class three trucks. And about 50% of class three trucks are in fact purchased by businesses, and obviously therefore the other 50% or so are registered to an individual. However, importantly, when we look at this segment in Again, transition because it's kind of right in the middle. But more importantly, it's a transition because a lot of independent contractors use Class 3 trucks. They use them in their business on a day-in and day-out basis, but they also then use it in their personal life, whether it's the truck that they drive back and forth to work, <clears throat> excuse me, or the vehicle that they use to, to tow a motorhome, a trailer, skidoos, a boat, whatever it might be, and they have elected to register that vehicle in their private name versus in their business name. And then you can see as we step up, class the red bar is class four through six trucks, you're up over 80%, and then obviously class sevens and eight trucks, you're up in the 95% range of those vehicles are in fact registered to a, a business. So when we talk often about work trucks, you can see we try we primarily talk about class three through class eight, but we could very easily step down and include all trucks that are registered to a business in that work truck environment. Now, oftentimes people say, well, gee whiz, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you judge the market? How do you know where it's going? And I'm not an economist, but, I, but I'm always looking for correlations. I'm looking, always looking for things that track. And so what I've shown in this chart, the, the uh, bar represents the number of units that have been registered new in class four through eight vehicles on each calendar year. And you can see the high point is actually in 2006, where just slightly less than 600,000 vehicles were registered new of class four through eight vehicles in that year. And then when the recession started, it dropped down to just over 200,000 vehicles, and that's total vehicles. That's three, or excuse me, four through eight total vehicles registered new. So remember that number, because as we talk about other charts, we're going to show that when your starting point is 200, 225,000 vehicles, and you look over time, and you look at scrappage, you look at um, repairs, or you look at vehicles that have been in accidents and taken off the road, that number just goes down. But uh, what you see then is that line, green line, which tracks change in GDP. Now that's kind of the health of the, the economy. If the economy is not robust, then people don't need goods, they don't need services that these work trucks are providing. So it does have a correlation. It doesn't turn immediately, but it, you can see that when the economy starts to show a downward turn, like we have in 2016, and we call 2016 our index because we track new and then we say, what does that infer for the full calendar year? Our current index of vehicles is slightly less than 500,000 this calendar year, and you can see everybody knows what the economy is doing, so the, de the demand for trucks has come down. Importantly, the demand for trucks has been most readily uh, seen in tractors that carry goods that people are no longer buying in the same quantities that they were buying. So when you look at what's going on in the marketplace, the yellow line going through this chart represents the total new registrations of class 
four through eight vehicles. And then I've shown the bars. I would focus you on the, the lime green bar. That's classes four through seven. It's the, their share of commercial vehicles. And if you kind of draw a line where the, uh, the bottom is and go left to, to the left side of the chart, you'll see that predominantly in history, uh, the commercial vehicle space has been dominated by class four through seven vehicles. Uh, very heavily influenced on class six because of very heavy influence by the rental leasing. But when we hit our bottom in 2009 and then start to come out of the recession with new registrations, you'll see that in the first year or two, uh, classes four through seven vehicles, we're kind of driving that recovery in class in 2010. From then on, you'll see the black bar. That's class eight new registrations. They were pretty much driving the growth uh, and out through 2015. And now you can see in 2016 in our index, class eight registrations are down. Through the first nine months of the 2016 calendar year, class eight registrations are actually down about 18% year over year. If you look at the class eight vehicles in two categories, one would be tractors, and then you look at what we would call straight trucks. Trucks that are uh, like a, a Mack truck that's converted and used for a dump, as a giant dump. Well, the tractor side of the class eight market is fully down over 25% in the first nine months of this calendar year as compared to the same nine months last calendar year. And the straight truck in class eight is actually up about four and a half percent or so. So it really is a story about the, the demand for class eight trucks going down. Now you say, why is that? Well, this green bars represents the, the overall industry once again. You can see the fall off. But that, that line going through the center, that uh, kind of bluish line, represents the number of or the percent of class eight trucks that have been purchased by large fleets those fleets that operate 500 or more vehicles. So those are your carriers. Those are the, the uh, companies that are moving goods from point A to point B cross country, whether it be north, south, east, or west. And what you can see is in 2005, six, and seven, they were under 40%. And in 2007, when we hit our high water, uh, or the year after we hit our high water mark, they actually fell off a little bit because there was pre-buying by these big fleets in 2006. But from then on, you can see that the big fleets were driving the demand for Class A trucks. They were holding the market and pulling the market along with them because they were replenishing their fleets. They were, they were bringing in the new vehicles and putting them in service because there was starting to be larger demand for goods that need to be moved from point A to point B. Now the result of, of this increase is when we look at what's going on by manufacture. And I've chosen four points in time. Uh, 2000 is what the market looked like way back at the you know, beginning of the last decade. And it was pretty much a common look all the way through the, the two, early 2000s where you know, international freight liner were the big dogs on the block, each of them accounting for about 20% of the business. And then you had stepped down to Ford at about 17%. By the time you move to 2007 with the, the recession starting to kick in, you'll see that uh, Freightliner fell down a little bit because the demand for these big trucks were falling, not falling off. International was going through some issues of, of their own uh, based on fuel economy regulations and decisions they were making. They saw their share drop to 12%, and it was all picked up primarily by Ford Motor Company, who saw an increase up to 23%. And that is really driven from dominance that Ford has in class three, four, five, and six vehicles. So uh, it's really, these are class four through eight, but Ford has that da dominant position in those mid-level heavy light duty trucks and then the medium duty trucks. By 2016, the first nine months, Freightliner's share of the commercial space, vehicles four through eight, has actually increased to 27%. International is down to 9%. And you have Ford at about 22% of class four through eight vehicles. Now, what kind of vehicles are these? 
this is just a very simple diagram of each class of vehicles is like a market onto itself. Each has unique representation by manufacturers and unique types of vehicles that are registered in those GVWs. And that really is um, the result of certain applications that are in the marketplace. But if we look at the total market, there's about six different vehicle types. And I've shown them here on the, on the right-hand side of this chart. That's a historical view of what these uh, types of vehicles have accounted for by share in the last 10 years, from 2006 through 2015. And then on the left-hand side of this chart, that's the share that they have for the first nine months of this calendar year. And basically, you can see tractor trucks and others have come down. That's the, the, uh, the big trucks. The other is actually buses. School bus and non-school bus registrations are actually down. And you can see the comparison line. But the two on the left-hand side, the red bar, rec recognizes a decline in that vehicle type registrations in the uh, first nine months compared to the 10-month average historically. Now, as I said, each GVW has a characteristic of the types of vehicles that are used. You know, if you talk about Class 4 trucks, up in the left-hand side of this box, cutaway vans are very big. They're used in rental leasing business. They're used to put a 10-foot box on the back of a cutaway. They're used in various applications, and then you have a, a straight truck. But typically, whether it's Class 4, 5, 6, or 7, there's typically two vehicle types that in fact dominate that class of vehicles. So if you look at, at um, class seven, you see school bus mentioned for the only time in all of these. Class seven trucks are uh, heavily influenced. You can see almost 40% in the uh, current uh, time frame as compared to historical perspective, but almost 40% of class seven new registrations are in fact school buses. So if you deal in component or parts in Class 7 trucks, you need to look at and be aware of what's going on because school buses have a very seasonal activity. You see them peak in the July, August time frame because of the new deliveries and new registrations to school districts, and then they go down. So they've got a very seasonal pattern that you need to be aware of. And it's also, quite frankly, that seasonal pan pattern of new registrations also has something to say about servicing of vehicles in certain periods of time. But again, you can see how it, how it breaks down by, um, by segment. Now, one of the things that we track, and it really feeds off of the types of vehicles by segment, is what, how are they being used? What vocations are they being used in? So in this chart, I've taken the, the individual out of the, um, the analysis. So the these are all non-individual breakdown of the marketplace. And you can see right across from 2007 through 2016, you can see how there are about five different uh, or six different categories of uh, occupations, if you will, that these trucks get registered in. The largest two are the bottom two segments of each bar. Rental leasing. You can see from 2007 through 2016. Rental leasing has been either right at 20% or as high as 29% in 2011, 27% in 2012. So a very heavy influence by rental leasing companies on new registrations over time. And then you can see the second most frequently used is general freight, the movement of goods uh, from point A to point B. And then you can see we've got some utilities we track the bus transportation, construction, and government kind of uh, winds out the six primary categories that in total account for about 80% of all new registrations um, by calendar year. Now there's a lot of talk about the fuel and, and what type of fuel is driving commercial vehicles. Again, on the right-hand side, that's the average of fuel. Um, basically the average of the engines and the type of fuel those engines use coming out of the factory between 2006 and 2015. And again, you can see mid 80% of the trucks in class four through eight were in fact powered by a diesel engine. 
You can see by the time we look at 2016, the first nine months, we're down just slightly under 80% of the new registrations are in fact powered by diesel engines. You can see an increase in gasoline and basically a little bit of an increase in natural gas. But again, most of the natural gas engines are uh, installed in trucks after they leave the factory. So they're, in, they're a secondary installation uh, in a geographic location based on either incentives with a manufacturer that uh, fuel providers provide or government institutions that are providing in a dirt certain uh, geographic area. So most of those conversions are in fact happening after the, the vehicle leaves the plant. However, each manufacturer preps their vehicles for conversion. So we can track where vehicles are that have been prepped for conversion versus those that you know came out of the factory as a standard diesel diesel truck. And we work with manufacturers of identifying vehicles that have been prepped to see whether or not they have in fact gone through that conversion. Now the next chart talks about HGVW. And you saw the decline in overall penetration of diesel engines. This chart basically, and I apologize for the the eye chart, but basically it takes each GVW and shows the share of that GVW's new registrations that are accounted for by a diesel engine. And I call your attention to the very first bar, which is kind of a dark color that starts in 2000, just under 60%. And by the time you get to 2016, the first nine months, you'll see that it's down at around 20%. Now you say, why is that? Well, that's class four trucks. Class four trucks are dominated by a single manufacturer. That single manufacturer builds their own proprietary diesel engine, and they allocate that diesel engine across class three, four, five, and in some cases, class six trucks. And if you try to buy that manufacturer's uh, products in class three, it will come standard with a diesel engine. You can order optional uh, these, uh, gasoline, but standard configuration is the diesel. Conversely, in class four for that manufacturer, that the standard configuration is a gasoline engine, and if you want to order a diesel, you can put your order in, and they will satisfy it as availability it is there. So you can see that once they move to their proprietary engine, in that 2009, 10, 11 time frame and moved away from partnerships that they had with another, with an engine manufacturer, the share of, of diesel penetration in that class of vehicles has gone down. The rest of the vehicle segments, class five, class six, um, class seven, or, or class five and class six, you can see they're running in that mid uh, 75 to 80% range. Obviously when you get to class uh, sevens and eights, the red and the blue bar that's almost tapping out at 100%, you can see that they're up at over 95% diesel in installations coming out of the factory. Now when you look at the diesel market very specifically by manufacturer, you can see that there's really four primary manufacturers in the market. Uh, Cummins is the dominant. Cummins accounts for over 40% of all diesel engine uh, installations in the commercial space in classes four through eight. And then you step down and you've got Detroit Diesel, and you can see that they're, they're running right now in that mid uh, 15 to 20% range. And then you step down to the other, the, uh, the other two, and that's uh, the blue bar is Packard, and then you have the red bar that's Ford. Again, the purple bar coming through the middle of the chart, that's the overall uh, share of these manufacturers, which really corresponds to the, the uh, primary piece of the installations of diesel engines, and that's, the, that's right around 80% as shown on the right-hand uh, scale for the axis. Now, I'm going to move into another type of analysis that we do, and that's very germane to understanding what's going on in the commercial space. And that is, everybody is aware of, you, you can read uh, publications, be it transport topics, heavy duty trucking, you can look at Wall Street Journal, you can look at a number of publications that at the end of a month they talk about what's going on in the industry, what's happening in the industry. Now, 
when you look when you're looking at automotive you're talking 14 15 16 million vehicles per annum uh, you can you know you can feel comfortable that it's, it's probably working somewhat regularly across the country although that's not totally true but when you're talking about five to six hundred thousand vehicles and that's the total vehicle population of class four through eight new registrations you really want to talk about where is it happening so we we conduct for our uh, clients and they do it on their own with their own proprietary geography they look at what's going on in various parts of the country so we for this analysis we've just really taken four general breakouts it doesn't uh, pertain to any one OEM uh, geography it's what I would call IHS automotives uh, market geography but it's important important to look at when we talk if you were looking and reading publications they would say that basically new registrations of commercial vehicles in class four through eight on an annualized basis on a year-over-year -year compare are actually down 3.4 percent. They would talk to you that class eight trucks are down 18.3 percent, class seven trucks are down about 1.5 percent, and the other GVWs are actually up year-over-year. -year. And then they would talk to you about, or what they wouldn't talk to you about is how these vehicles are performing by geographic area. And as you can see on the right hand side of this chart, if you're doing business in the central part of the United States, your total new registrations of these vehicles by class is actually down 14.8%, not 3.4%. So a much different picture if you're doing business in the central part of the United States as compared to the northeast part of the United States where class these class of vehicles are actually up year over year by over 8%, almost 9%. So again, we always tell our clients, and when we do analysis for our clients, we always really stress that they should be looking at the market by a regional basis, some type of geography to get a true feel for what's going on. And the reason this happens is that you've got concentrations of fleets of certain types and sizes in geographic areas. You've got big dealer organizations in certain uh, parts of the country that are registering their vehicles in those areas. And so this is reflective of how those businesses and how those dealerships are in fact ordering uh, vehicles. And since it's a consistent reporting year over year, it is indicative of what's going on in that market as far as registrations are concerned. Now, I'm going to segue here and talk a little bit about, about four charts that talk about new registrations versus vehicles in operation. And it's critical. If you're a, a company looking at doing business in the commercial space and you're trying to figure out how do I do it, where do I do it, and you know this type of analysis is really important because what it says, if you look at the left-hand column, that uh, new registrations of class four through eight vehicles 43% of new registrations in the first nine months of this calendar year were in fact made by fleets operating 500 or more vehicles. Now it varies by class of vehicle as you go up and down. So class five has the lowest number of big fleets buying or registering new vehicles. And as you can see, class sevens and eights and sixes are actually dominated by big fleets. First time registering a vehicle to those big fleets. However, fast forward and look at the total vehicle population and how does that vehicle population break down. You can see on the right-hand side of this chart that only 22% of the vehicles in operation running on the U.S. highway are in fact accounted for by fleets operating 500 or more vehicles. So there's a dichotomy here. If you're selling original equipment, vehicles, parts, providing services, uh, to big fleets, you know, your business is when it's first registered new. If you now are looking for servicing of parts, providing services to the industry in total, and you get yourself out beyond that three, four, five, six year window when the big fleets turn that inventory and put it back in the marketplace fully, 22% of those vehicles are being operated by big fleets. And you can see that means that 78% of the fleet or the vehicles on the road are in fact being operated by fleets of less than 500 vehicles. And quite honestly, 
we can take this analysis all the way down to fleets of less than 50 vehicles, fleets that are owned by uh, entrepreneurs, vehicles of one, you would find that there's a dispersion of these vehicles across the United States by mid, small, and individual owners once they pass out of the big fleet's hands. Hey, Gary, we have a couple questions here. For you. Sure. Okay. One of them is, uh, are any of these regional variances affected by state legislation slash taxes on fleet registration? Not really. Uh, that they, they used to be the case. Uh, you used to have a couple of states that uh, tried to increase their registration of vehicles by having and offering lower registration rates. But basically today it's pretty much equalized across the states. It really does have an implication for some big companies that register in a certain geographic area because that's where they process everything. Or there are vehicle handlers that process all the paperwork. But again, those vehicle handlers, those big fleets, they're consistent in those in those states year over year. So we do have an apples and apple comparison versus an apple and orange comparison. Uh, because uh, there may be an alluding to the question of privacy states. The information on a privacy state impacts the allowability of us to provide names and addresses of fleets. Statistics are reported by every state consistently on a month-in and month-out basis. So while Pennsylvania is a privacy state, we cannot provide you owner information in the state of Pennsylvania. Our data does, in fact, reflect all new registrations or registrations of vehicles on the road in Pennsylvania. So statistically, we have a full view of the universe in the United States. It's just that there is some legal regu uh, regulations we need to comply with as far as lead generation. Okay, thank Next, you. You got another, you got another one? This one more. Is registration blurred by where the vehicle is registered versus where it is deployed? Great question. Uh, and it's really the registrations are tracked by where the vehicle is registered. So where it's registered, not where it's domiciled. However, because we have the ability to what we call fleet net, so we can look at fleets of all various sizes. Our and we can also look at fleets of by vehicle type. So obviously when we're looking at uh, demand for vehicles in a geographic area, and we're looking, uh, helping clients talk about service potential in a geographic area, or parts replacement demand, we take tractors out of the equation. Tractors are made to move, and so we take those out of the equation. We take fleets of 250 or more vehicles out of the equation because, again, they're primarily fleets that operate tractors. Some of them are operating day cabs, so they're not necessarily domiciled in that area 24-7. And we get down to the types of vehicles that are used in service, delivery, uh, whatever it might be in that geographic area. So we overcome some of the issues with where a vehicle is registered by looking at the fleet size in, in these areas and taking out types of vehicles that are made to move cross country or move you know out of the area on a regular basis. So we can get down to if somebody says how many vehicles are registered in St. Louis, we can tell you how many vehicles are registered in St. Louis. We can tell you how they're broken down by fleet and we can give you a very very good approximation of the vehicles that are registered in serviced and used in St. Louis, Missouri compared to those that are just registered there by going through the in-depth analysis based on vehicle type fleet sizing to get down to a domicile type of, uh, of account. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Okay. Now, uh, just to continue on this, this comparison of new registrations versus vehicles in operation, this next chart talks about uh, new registrations by vehicle type across uh, and GVW across um, 
the spectrum. So these are these are new registrations by primary vocations, and you can see how they break out. So new registrations again, the blue bar that's rental leasing, highly influential in class four, class six, uh, not as um, influential in class seven because we start to see some of the bus transportation being more dominant in class seven, and then you can see in class eight it's a mix between of the uh, uh, individuals, or excuse me, general freight and rental leasing. But you can see overall new registrations uh, by primary vocation. You can see that the rental leasing, that blue bar, is dominant up to almost 25% in this time period. If you do that same analysis of vehicles in operation by primary vocation, you'll see that that red bar across the bar, those are individuals that have purchased those uh, vehicles that are in operation. So 45% of vehicles in operation in class four are in fact registered to an individual on a vehicles in operation basis. And you can see that red bar is dominant in four, five, and six. And again, shares in class seven with bus transportation and then shares with general freight in class eight. But again, in the total, it, it breaks out that it's the, the dominant type of uh, usage. Now, if you do and lay them side by side, top to bottom, that just reinforces the difference. So again, if you're coming into the marketplace and you're looking at going to market with building a market strategy, be it for marketing, sales, service, parts, whatever it might be, you really need to determine is it first time buyers you're going to go after that have a need for your product and service or is it the vehicle population in total because that will dictate which kinds of data you look at and how you look at the data. Now I mentioned up front we talked about the uh, the size of the vehicle market. This chart just shows that there's 9.1 million vehicles on the road for class 4 through 8 vehicles by model year. So the, the greenish dark bar is class four and seven. The line bar is class eight vehicles. And you can see, again, that red circle highlights the, the dearth of vehicles that are available. Less than 100,000 uh, model year 2010 vehicles, whether it be you're talking class four through seven combined or class eight individually, less than 100,000 of those vehicles have a 2010 VIN on them. So we've had questions often raised by part suppliers, by service providers saying, gosh, my business is down. I'm usually refurbing. I'm re usually doing a lot more business in this time frame on five, six, seven-year-old vehicles, and my business is down. Why is that? Well, when you have a, because of the recession, when you had a low initial new registration, that just carries it through. That bubble stays in the market. Bubble, if it's good, in a, in a quantity if it's bad. So right now we're going through that dearth where 2010 vehicles, which would be in their prime for perhaps total overhauls and the like, there aren't many of them out there. If you look at the vehicle population by region, by type, you can see that most of the vehicles in operation are in fact in the central part of the United States, followed by the south. If you look at vehicle type, you've got over 30% are either a tractor or a straight truck. And then you look at GVWs, obviously the biggest part of the, the uh, vehicle population on the road is Class 8 trucks. Over 45% 40 of the vehicle population is in fact these Class 8 uh, vehicles. If you look at what's operated by small fleets, fleets operating 1 to 499 vehicles as of the end of September, again, you can see this is, this is the local business primarily. And again, you can see 2010, just slightly more than 50,000 vehicles of both class four through seven, as well as class eight available for providing service and parts in the marketplace. So it really behooves a, in a, um, a client or a prospect to understand the numbers and not only understand how many, but where. So this just takes that same one to 499 uh, vehicle count for vehicles in operation and breaks it down and shows where it is within of a certain model year by a geographic area. And again, when you're talking geographic areas, uh, you look at 2010, 2011, there's no concentration greater than 20,000 vehicles 
operated by fleets of one to four ninety nine in any one geographic area. So again, some people have, a, have, a, have compared this to a, the needle in the haystack. Uh, you need to know where these people are because they are not distributed evenly across the United States and by geographic area. Now you say, how is the vehicle operation broken down by region? I've just taken the, the top uh, OEMs, and really there's the top three are Ford, Freightliner, and International. You can see that Ford operates over 1.8 million vehicles with a Ford label on them it are operated in the United States, and you can see how they're broken down by, by region. Really pretty evenly dispersed. Obviously, the, the uh, Northeast has the lowest piece. That's also the lowest share of, of vehicles in the, in the vehicle population. Very heavy in the West for Ford, as well as in the South part of the United States. Uh, as you work across the Freightliner, they step down to just slightly more than 1.6 million vehicles on the road, and then you step down to international, just a little bit more than 1.4 million vehicles on the road. When you talk about the other major manufacturers, be it Peterbilt, Kenworth, Chevrolet, Mack, GMC, or Volvo, you can see that you're now stepping down to something less than 600,000 vehicles on the road for these brands across the United States. Another chart that's a little bit of an eye chart, and I apologize, but you know it does speak to the diversity of the the Chevrolet, the Ford, uh, and even Freightliner and GMC's uh, product portfolio. So you can see the types of vehicles that are available. So if you're if you're doing uh, work with Chevrolet and you're looking at doing some motorhome pieces, Chevrolet has a fair number of chassis out there that are motorhome chassis that are available for service and parts. And, but their biggest share of it is the dark, the dark green. Those are uh, cab chassis. Cab chassis is a vehicle that's um, basically a light duty configuration, very similar to a straight truck. Straight truck would be a, a medium duty configuration. So cab chassis comes off of a pickup. Uh, straight truck would come off of a medium duty chassis. But you can see as it goes across. And obviously, once you get out to International, Kenworth, Mack, Peterbilt, uh, Volvo, they are primarily tractors and, uh, and straight truck configurations across the country. Now, one of the questions that's often asked is the vehicle population. How old is it? Where, you know, so we've talked about where it's at, who has it, uh, what type it is, but now you talk about the age. And basically, if you look at 2007, uh, the year after the, the highest level of new registrations of class uh, four through eight vehicles, and compared to the first nine months of the 2016 calendar year, you'll notice two things. The vehicle population has gotten two years older. Now, you say, wow, that's good. And it is. It means that there's more older trucks on the road that need to have parts and service provided for them. The aging is really a, a you know a combination of many factors. One of which is obviously technology has made the trucks run longer. They have better engines, they have better warranties, and so they're getting more service. But the average age of the truck is now 14 years on the road in our vehicle population. It's dominated by the big green piece, which is class uh, six trucks. And those the cl average class six truck on the road today is 21 years old. And you say, how can that be? Well, class six trucks are primarily used in rental leasing, or they go back into the marketplace because they're such a great configuration. Strong engine, great automatic transmission, 20-foot box on them, very versatile as far as how they can be used in their second life. So the combination of uh, rental leasing companies that have kept these trucks in their fleet, and I would you know mention that anybody that has rented a 20-foot foot box truck through a, any number of the rental leasing companies, probably the first question you get asked is how many miles you're going to drive, where are you going to use it, and then that will dictate the price. That price is dictated by the year model of the vehicle you're being renting. If you're driving from Detroit to Chicago, you're going to get a fairly new vehicle. If you're driving from in Detroit from Troy to, to Sterling Heights, that's 15 miles, they're probably going to offer you a very low price vehicle that may have a VIN plate on it that could be a 1990s VIN, but it doesn't mean it's a bad truck. It just means that it's older 
in um, it's available for your rental. So that's class six truck. You can walk around. Basically, every class of vehicles has moved up. Uh, class five trucks has actually uh, gone down, and the reason for that is class five is kind of a sweetheart of the market right now. They're the smallest segment of vehicles in the commercial space, and they have been setting records year after year for the last two and a half years and month by month. So a great deal of new trucks coming into this space for certain applications by fleets uh, in, in, the, um, in the market. I mentioned, and I'm just going to show you one chart. I mentioned that we do a lot of work on parts uh, demand. This just happens to be a chart that says we track remanufactured demand and we track 34 specific parts that can be remanufactured and we look at uh, what the demand is for the new part of that category and we look at what the remand demand is and then the total demand. And what you, what you see very rarely is that remand um, has gained or is, is a large piece. So the, the market has in fact move to the acceptance of remand parts. Now, you say, why is that total over to the right-hand side not? When you look at 15.9 and 17.1, uh, the total demand for these parts, because there, be, there can be other types. There can be salvage uh, demand. There can be rebuild demand, uh, other things. So the, the remand parts specifically represent about 45% of the parts that we track the customer would be satisfied with a remand part to replace an, a current existing part in their vehicle. I'm going to show you a couple of charts on, on trailers. For those of you that are interested in the trailer market, uh, the, the orange bar running through the middle of the chart shows uh, vans, both refrigerated and dry vans, share of total trailers. As you can see, it's right now at its all-time high uh, in the 2016 uh, first part of the year. If, and then you look at the total trailer demand is the dark green chart, and you can see it, it pretty much follows what's happened in the, the vehicle side of it, and then you can see how vans have come up. The interesting part in 2016 is the demand for trailers is actually increasing, and the demand for uh, tractors is actually declining. It's the first time that we've seen that kind of dichotomy that says there's the, the, the big carriers are actually replenishing uh, their trailer inventory, but they're keeping their, um, their vehicle inventory a little bit more in check. And this chart just shows the comparison of um, total van, new registrations, compared to tractor, uh, tractor in class 7s and 8. So you can see that there's always more tractors registered than there are trailers, but you look at that last bar out to the far right-hand side, and in the first eight months of this calendar year, they're actually, um, you can see a decline year over year, and you can see a decline from the first eight months of 2015 to the first eight months of 2016. Trailer, the dark bar uh, for vans, have gone up, and tractors in class seven and eight have actually gone down. Now, what's our, what's our forecast? look like for class four through eight vehicles. Basically over the next, uh, between now and the 2020, we basically see the, uh, the market for class four through seven vehicles fairly flat uh, over the, the time horizon. Uh, in class eight, we see a recovery will begin in 2017, and then you can see how the sales will track uh, in 18, 19, 20, uh, pretty much at a, at a flat market rate uh, going forward. For those of you that are uh, participating in this in this series that are from Canada, uh, a couple of charts to show you what's going on in Canada. And this chart takes a little bit, but uh, Canada is a unique market. Canada is dictated by Class 3 vehicles or Class 8 vehicles. So you can see the total demand for uh, commercial vehicles in Canada. That's the line chart that goes through the you know, the, the middle of the chart, it does track very close to what happens in the United States. And you can see it, it bottomed in 2009 and then came back. Came back much faster than it did in the United States. Unfortunately, it did subside it. And it's now on a downward track for two consecutive uh, calendar years. And you can see the reason for that is, again, Class A trucks. 
that pinkish uh, bar on the far right side of each of these years. You can see Class A trucks have dominated Canada all the way through the uh, 2008 calendar year. And then Class 3 trucks have really picked up, and it's been touch and go with what's going on. But in 2016, Class 3 trucks are up over 40% at their highest level of penetration in Canada. And quite honestly, Class 8 trucks are near their lowest level of penetration in the Canadian market. It probably goes without saying that the biggest, we track it by province. We have every province in Canada tracking new registrations and vehicles in operation. And again, in 2016, Ontario, big dog in the block. Now, in 2016, um, new registrations, almost 40% of new registrations in Canada are in fact accounted for by the province of Ontario. When we look at vehicles in operation by a model year, not not a very different, just a level, different level of magnitude, but a very similar story to what you saw in the charts in the United States. And again, this speaks back to a very small number of vehicles on the road in Canada. And if you look at 2009, 2010 models, except for Class 8, uh, less than 15,000 of those classes of vehicles on the road available for uh, servicing and parts in the 2016 calendar year. For Canada, uh, a little slightly different. We just see the, the Canadian market for classes four through seven vehicles continuing to increase and grow. We see a little bit of a, a flatness. Uh, we see some growth in class eight in 2018 and then coming back down in 2019. On a global basis, Let's just say it, put it very simply, we see continued growth in the commercial space. We see it being driven, if you look at the percent of the growth, driven by the uh, APAC region of, of the world, followed by Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and North America. So the growth in commercial vehicle that's going on outside the United States is really being driven by APAC and Eastern and Western Europe. Now we're getting close on time, so I am just going to tell you and show you that the rest of this uh, there's about five charts that you can go through at your leisure. As I said up front, the government has now put in place uh, requirements for uh, commercial vehicles, and that's driven off of their own internal study that says that heavy-duty trucks and buses account for about 20% of the energy used in the United States, and they need to be regulated. I'm going to fast forward to show you the results. These are how they break the sectors down for regulation. They break them into four categories, a uh, combination of tractors and trailers, uh, tractors pulled by combination or trailers pulled by uh, tractors. They have all your vocational vehicles in the center and then they have large pickups and vans. And you can see how they account for the fuel consumption uh, by these categories. Bottom line is they have developed regulations that are looking for, by 2027, a CO2 fuel consumption reduction of about 25% for tractors, 90% for trailers, 24% for vocational vehicles, and about 16% for pickups and vans. Now, I've gone through a lot of information, gone through it very quickly. If something like this is of interest to you, we do a quarterly report that we put out. Uh, no charge. We, we send it out to anybody that asks for the report. It's an opt-in, not an opt-out. And um, I think my my phone number or my, or my uh, email address is on the last page. But if it's not shown there, my email address is just Gary, G-A-R-Y dot Mateer, M-E-T-E-E-R at I-H-S market dot com. Send me an email and just say, Please send me your report. We'll get you on the distribution list, and it'll come out to you every quarter uh, with no uh, no hands or, or no commitment on any way, shape, or form. With that, uh, oops, that concludes my prepared remarks. Uh, do we have any other questions, or anybody have a question now? Well, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, yes, uh, I do have a question here. Actually, 
Actually, there's no more questions. I'm sorry. Um, that is the end of our presentation. And thank you so much, Gary, for your uh, webinar. This webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Auto Care Association website at www.autocare.org slash industry hyphen analysis hyphen webinars. And thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you.